For today we're talking about following Jesus, and my passage today is from Luke chapter 14. Now this comes about uh, in about the middle of uh, Jesus' ministry. And it starts out in Luke 14, verse 25, describing that Jesus had large crowds following him. I think every teacher, every preacher would have a dream of large crowds following him. Every church has probably a vision statement. Well, not everyone, but uh, many do, that have numbers attached to it. We are at 200 in our membership now. In 10 years, we plan to have 2,000. I've read vision statements like that, and they seem okay to most of the people. This is the dream. Well, let's see what Jesus does. Chapter 14 of Luke, uh, starting verse 25. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, this is verse 29, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with his 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up his own possessions. Let's, let's stop right there. This is about following Jesus, and uh, we've, we've just heard a wonderful song. You don't really have to pay anything to the Father. I've got a message that seemingly contradicts this. You've got to calculate the price before you follow Jesus. But did you notice the word seemingly there? It's because it just seems that way. When you think about it, if you come to Jesus, all he is requiring is your faith. But then, if you follow Jesus, all he's requiring is the entire self of yours. In fact, it's even more. We're going to discover in this passage he requires everything. There's nothing that you can leave behind, nothing that you can keep, nothing that can still be your own. There was a missionary in Thailand. By the way, I know Thailand becomes a very special country to this congregation. Do you know why? Yeah, there's, there's a group of people that are right now serving all the way in Thailand. Amazing, isn't it? The Lord calls us to all kinds of different places. So they felt the Lord was calling them to Thailand. And in fact, I know that Pastor Gregory is going there in, in a little while. Isn't that right? So we need to keep him in prayer. So there was this missionary in Thailand. His name was Parker Henderson. He's been helping people all of his life, trying to minister to them, to the natives in this country. And he says, if I had my life to live over again, I would spend it in the same way, helping people. There is no progress until people's lives are being changed. Make your life count. The only way you can do that is by following Jesus. Now, you can probably try some other things, but you will end up losing your life. You will end up trying to find your way back to Jesus. So while you're young, it's good to make that decision as long as you're young. Let's consider the setting. We're going back to the passage in Luke chapter 14, and the setting is described to us in verse 25. It says, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, Large crowds. I said that's a dream of every preacher, every teacher to build a mega church, you know. They were going after him. They were following Jesus. Uh, why? Well, because he was feeding them, because their needs were met. I remember back in Ukraine where I come from, when this is true about, about every, almost every uh, past Soviet nation, every CIS country, you minister to people and you, you plug in the social aspect of it. And, and that's a fancy word for start feeding the people, bringing in what they called humanitarian aid, right? You, you start giving them um, the stuff. <laughs> 
uh, you start giving them the foodstuffs and also the, the clothing and whatever else meets their needs. Now, did Jesus do that? Yes. Was that the basis of his ministry? If that was, that wouldn't be it. If that was the basis of his ministry right there, Jesus would have been happy. He would turn to these crowds and said, great job. Bring more people. I'll get out more food. You know, Jesus didn't start out a hunger problem. The only reason he fed the people was to show that he was the true Messiah. If Jesus was there to solve the hunger problem of the world, then that's what we would be doing all along. But that's not our primary focus. And Jesus is turning to these people, and he knows that they've been following him for that one reason. And again, back in Ukraine and all those countries, we've had many of these people who would come to the ministry centers and to the meeting points and, and to the evangelist meetings and so forth only, get their portion, only in order to get their portion of food or clothing. And then the, 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 the crowds or the ranks would get thinned because they'd find out there's a commitment that you have to make in order to follow Jesus. And many of them were not ready to make that commitment. And so it's easy to come to Jesus, but it's hard to follow him. They were following because of the miracles, but then they, when they discovered what it is to follow Jesus for sure, you know, there were very few that were left. Jesus was very popular, and he turns around and he looks at these crowds, and just like verse 25 says, he speaks to them. It was time for him to let them know the true meaning of following him what that involved. He wanted them to understand that there was a price to be paid to follow him. It was time to thin out the ranks. And, and God, does, God does that a number of times. He wants committed people to follow him. He wants to show that he is able to change the world even with a handful of people, even the, the first disciples, the 12 apostles, or even back in Israel. I mean, consider Israel in comparison to the rest of the nations of the world. A very unlikely choice, if I was God, was to choose Israel, such a tiny, small nation, completely defenseless against all its neighbors. That was the very reason God chose it, in order to show that, you know, only through my might you can be saved. And if you're not going to rely on me, you are going to be in a big trouble. And as you know, the ten tribes finally ended up in that trouble, unfortunately. Uh, the story of Gideon, remember? Thinning out the ranks, thinning down, downsizing. <laughs> I mean, every other military leader would want more to be conscripted. He would say, well, you know, we probably don't have enough. Let's get every armed man from every village possible. He would say, well, let's get high-spirited about this and so forth. Not God. He said, no, we, we have too many. And, and then he downsizes the group to how many people there? 300, do you remember that? If there is a storm that is coming, imagine that you have several ships out there uh, in the harbor, but then some of them are empty and others are loaded, and you have very limited time. Which ships would you want to be brought back into the harbor and onto the sea, uh, onto the shore? The ones that are empty or the ones that are loaded? Well, probably the ones that are loaded, right? You, you're going to want to have those ships saved in a priority way. You know, we spend too much of our time on so-called empty ships. And, and Jesus is merciful. He wants everyone to come to him. But then he says, okay, it's good that you've come, but I want to be honest with you. There is a price to be paid if you'd like to follow me. And so here is the terms of the consecration. We start at verse 26. He deals, first of all, with the personal relationships that every one of us has when we come to Jesus. In verse 26, this is how he speaks to the crowds. This is what he says to us today. Verse 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yet, uh, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I uh, hate the word hate for the lack of a better explanation. When I teach in various of my classes, middle school or high school, I try to t teach the children, please don't use that word. Uh, that's too strong. <laughs> 
The reason Jesus is using this word is to underline the difference between the two loves. He is not saying stop liking or stop loving your father and mother. That would be a contradiction to one of the commandments with the promise, remember? It says, honor your father and mother. And that's, that's the only commandment with the promise. It comes with the promise. What's the promise, by the way? So that your life could be prolonged, so that you could have a long and happy life here on earth. Well, again, he's not contradicting that, but he says, look, your love to me in comparison to your love, to your, with, with your love to your loved ones, is like, well, what shall we compare it to? Okay, let's, uh, let me give you a little illustration. Um, how far is the moon? It's pretty far, isn't it? None of us have probably been there. <laughs> it's, it's far away. But then how far is the closest star to us? A huge difference. Uh, hundreds of thousands times the distance between us and the moon, between the earth and the moon. So the earth and the moon have a, have a huge distance, but in comparison to the distance to the closest star, that's nothing, that's tiny. So Jesus says, in comparison to what you experience when you love your father and mother, if you compare that to loving me, that should be tiny. That should be like hate to love. That's what he's saying here. Uh, on one of the youth conferences a while ago, I think that was in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, and some of you may have heard this uh, illustration. There was a brother who was speaking there, and he said, uh, he, he told a story about the times of the persecution in the former Soviet Union and, and how the evangelical church was persecuted by the communist regime and, and how in one of the churches there was a police officer who disliked one of the sermons because the preacher was saying that everybody's a sinner. The police officer came up and said, do you mean me as well? Am I a sinner as well? And if uh, the preacher wanted to be politically correct, he might have concocted something, but he did not. He simply knew the word of God. He was that simple. Oh God, please grant us that faith. And, and so he just said, well, the Bible is very plain and frank about that. Everybody's a sinner, and that includes you. You're a dead man, said the policeman, and next, uh, next thing the preacher knew, he found himself in prison. And, and so then the church started to negotiate with the government in terms of, well, what do we do to free our brother? There was little that they could do, but then the government said, you know what, there's something that you could do. If you send somebody who could take his place in prison, we could probably free him. And that's the announcement that went in the church. Is there someone who would be willing to go and take his place? Not a whole lot of volunteers. In fact, none at all. Finally, there was this older brother who decided to go. And uh, when he went, and the reason he went there to, to prison to exchange places with the pastor is because the pastor had a family and a wife to care for and children and so forth. And uh, he he thought, well, I don't have a family. I'm an old person, my children are growing up, and I could probably change places with the pastor. So he made his way to the prison, and at the prison gate, he met with the pastor, and the authorities said, okay, go ahead and do the exchange. Well, the pastor wouldn't budge. He would not move. He didn't want to make an exchange. They asked him, why? Your family's waiting for you out there. Why wouldn't you want that? Well, he said, because I am a follower of Jesus. If I leave these people to whom I minister, the people who have become Christians through my ministry, even though he has been there for about a week or two only, these people who have accepted him would not have a way to grow in their faith. These people wouldn't have the possibility to follow him. So he literally fulfilled this verse. You know, there's choices that we make in our lives, and you're thinking, well, that's an example from the past. How can this look like today? I understand you. There's one instance that I can think about of uh, in, 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 in my life that I saw a young man coming to Christ in his high school years. He changed dramatically in his life. And that was a joy for his parents. 
The parents were active members of the church, a Slavic Baptist church. They were, uh, his father was a successful businessman and he was uh, uh, very generous in terms of his contributions and so forth. And he thought, this is the best thing that could happen to me. You know, I've been praying about this all along. And here's my son becoming a Christian. What a wonderful thing. And he was thankful to God. But he was for a big sur in for a big surprise. In a few months, this particular son of his, who has become a Christian, decided to consecrate his life for Christ's sake. He heard the voice of God in his heart calling him to full-time ministry. But first, he wanted to go to a Christian college to get Christian education. That wasn't something that his parents were were planning for. You see, his parents thought, "Well, you're going to accept Christ, and and that's fine. That's enough. You know, don't get too involved in the church. It's going to take too much of your time. After all, we are preparing you to take on your family business. <laughs> that's uh, um, that's good to be Christian, but then you can always serve God, even even as you have your business. And yes, you can." But he heard the voice of Christ calling him to follow Jesus in a different way. And there are choices sometimes in our lives when Jesus needs to come first. And sometimes that's even between us and our parents. Could that be something that can happen in your life? This is really a question of priorities. And again, this is a question of distance. Our distance to Jesus should be closer than our distance to all the rest of the people even our close mates, our wives and husbands. Remember Paul, when he describes the last times later on in Scripture, he says those of us who have things or who have possessions or, or those of us who have loved ones, we should live as if we don't. Now that doesn't mean, well, if I have a family, forget about it. No, but that means live in the reality of the past times, understanding that Jesus' is coming can happen anytime that the persecution that is promised in Scripture for the last times can also, uh, can also deprive us, not only of our possessions, but even of our loved ones. So in verse 26, he says, you have to deal with your relationships. But then he continues. Jesus says, there is a price to pay to get consecrated and to be my follower. And that is verse 27. Again, we're back in Luke 14. He says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. A cross is not what we imagine today. There was a merchant in Venezuela and he was selling little wooden crosses. He was calling out to the tourists out there in the streets of Caracas. He was saying, cheap crosses! That would have been an oxymoron, a, a completely meaningless statement for somebody from the first century. A cross can never be cheap. A cross is uh, the most difficult torture you can only imagine. It was so bad the Romans outlawed themselves in about uh, couple of hundred years after Jesus' death. And so Jesus is making it very clear that this is the very gruesome torture that you can imagine. Are you ready for that kind of torture, he said, in order to follow me? But you see, the joy of knowing Christ in comparison to that torture is, it's, it's, it's going to outshine everything, let's put it that way. It's just like the moon, which you cannot see during a sunny day, but it's still there. You can't see it because the sun outshines it. Cross is real. Cross means death. Cross meant death to Christ. For us, it means death to our own desires. Uh, there is a good image in one of the books I've read. The book is called The Making of a Disciple, and the author there talks about discipleship in the same sense as flying a jet that is about to crash. Let's imagine that you are a pilot of an airplane that's about to crash. You have several options, don't you? Especially if you have time in your hands, you know that you can save your own life. But then, if this is a passenger jet, you've got people behind you that you need to save. Wouldn't you want to try to do that? Even though your life may be at stake and their life still, you are going to devote your life to saving them. Or perhaps you still have a few minutes 
and you have some parachutes and other possibilities to, to get their lives saved, but maybe your life wouldn't be saved. That's how it is with the Christian. We are sent here, and we are flying on a jet that is about to crash. This planet is going to crash any day now. And we know that. And we can either live for ourselves or live for a bigger purpose, just like that missionary in Thailand. In Galatians 2.20, Paul the Apostle makes it clear. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer that I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith, the faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. He says, Jesus has become a true living example for me. The cross is not a mere past event that I look back to, and some of us do that, and that's fine, but it's more, like, it's, it's much more than that. It's not only an event that defined my salvation, says Paul, it's an event that defines my life in its entirety. We must die ourselves, we must die to our wishes, we must renounce ourselves and seek Him first. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, God's righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, and all these, shame, all these things shall be added unto you, meaning the food, the clothing, and everything that this world is worried about. What is meant by dying to self? There's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself to find out if dying to self is a reality that happens in your life. How can you die to self, some ask? Does it mean that you have to forget your own personality? No, my friends, it's the other religions from the East that make you forget your personality. Uh, it's the Buddhism and so forth that say, well, you're just a little drop that needs to dissolve yourself in the ocean of nirvana. Forget about yourself. Jesus is not like that. He says, I'm here to redeem your personality. I want to give you a new heart, a new life, but that doesn't mean that you yourself will be completely crushed. However, what about your desires? What about your objectives? What about your life goals? Have you honestly and objectively taken your life goals before God? That's question number one. Question number two, do your goals find your ego more, feed your ego, excuse me, more than they glorify God? That's a tough one. And number three, are you willing to change your goals if they do not meet God's approval? Some people today have uh, what might be called a Burger King religion. In the Burger King, you say, they say, have it your way, right? You can order it any way you want. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all of us were like sheep that have gone astray, and each of us have turned every which way. It's the Satan's religion that says, have it your way. It's not God. It's not Christ. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, meaning on Jesus. And when we see his sacrifice, his love calls us to self-denial. Now, Jesus says there's a price to be paid. And we've talked about self-denial, and we've talked about relationships, and we've talked about desires, but there's more. Uh, back to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 14, and in verse 33, he says, So then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up his own possessions. What? I can't have anything in this world? No, you can. It's just don't let things own you, because most of the times that's how it happens. Things start owing us. We start looking at our wages in terms of, okay, I have to have enough to live upon, and then if I have the possibility, I'm going to tithe, and I'm going to give more to the church and to the, to the poor and to the cause of Christ. Should be the other way around, shouldn't be? He's not asking for much, just 10% that are his. He could have asked for 90. He has all the reasons he made us. He just says 10% are mine. If you'd like to give more, that's fine. 10% is the law. More than 10% is grace. Now, if 10% is the law, then less than 10% is what? 
Let's do that again. If 10% is the law, then less than 10% is what? Lawlessness. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, he starts owing in you because he has bought you out of the slave market of this world. And he sets you free, and yet who of us, when we realize what he has done for us, would turn away from Christ and says, okay, now I can do whatever I want. Absolutely not. That's the meaning of the covenant that Brother Bob was sharing just a while ago. Can we get rid of our stuff in order to be Christ's followers? That's not what he's asking. He's not asking to sell all of our possessions literally, even though that might be the calling of some. Remember that young rich ruler who could not easily uh, give him up. But he says, are you ready to follow me and not be owned by the stuff? God may require you maybe to give him up or he may take them. Abraham had to give up Isaac. Job had to give up his possessions as well. But again, I don't know whether you are going to be the rule or the exception. The idea is, Lord, whatever you want is yours. Verse 28, uh, verses 28 through 32 give us the reason for the consecration. It says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? That's uh, the illustration number two that he gives here. When he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. This is uh, the first illustration that's used here is the illustration of, of the building. Now, he doesn't mean, well, you count the cost or be embarrassed. The Lord himself is the builder. You see, he's already laid the foundation. He simply says, in order for you to follow the Lord, you've got to understand that he has already done everything for you. That word that Jesus uttered on the cross, paid in full, or it is finished, whatever way you translate it, is still true. He has done everything for your salvation. He knows everything about your life. Now, what's this about this price to be paid? Again, if you hold dearly to your life, you will lose it. Remember, that's what Jesus said. But if you give it up to him, that's the best place to keep it at. One of the missionaries, I think, was uh, Nate Saint. Uh, that's uh, one of the guys that was killed by the Aka people over in Ecuador in 1956. Uh, some of you may have seen the end of the spear movie right and so that's the, the the story of the missionaries and there's been a lot of books around about that story so nate saint in his diary he said he's no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to get what he cannot lose and yet you're a builder too and, and i'm a builder in a sense it's easier to destroy than to build right um, I remember a friend of mine was driving around the town and then he told me about one of his experiences. He saw a crew of builders who were demolishing a house. <laughs> well, the, the reason I put the builders in the converted commas is, is because when he, when he stopped his car, when he stopped his vehicle and get, got out of the vehicle and he found a guy that was in charge of the crew, he said, are these professional builders? And the guy said, oh, no, these are, these are just the demolishing crew. You don't really need that much experience and education to demolish a house. Just a few good tools and a safety helmet. Um, but, uh, but in order to build one, you do need some skill. Jesus says, you've got to, you've got to count the cost today. And then the illustration of fighting is used. Uh, the king coming out of, against another king, can he make it? Uh, if he cannot, then he makes, makes the terms of peace. Again, the idea is not, well, 
count the price, count the cost, or be destroyed. That's not what Jesus means here. He says there is a battle that we are against. Can we make it in the battle? No, but he is on our side, and he is able to help us. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read about the battle, starting with verse 10. Finally, says Paul there, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Those are strong forces. When we count the cost ourselves, we are not able to withstand it. Jesus says, if you follow me, that is the only way you can make it. We're going to need strength in this fight. We're going to need ability, courage, and strength as we build the tower of our lives. Let's trust it to the one who has the ability to give us that strength. Let's trust it to the one who has already proven his life, his love toward us. We must decide if we want to pay that price. We've come out of communist countries, and uh, one privilege that many of us have is not to know what communism really is. But if you look at the world map today, you're going to still find out that about one-fourth of the countries are still under communist rule. And some of you have had missionary trips there, and you will know, even with your short experience, that it's not a great joy to live in there. So. Uh, one way or the other, our parents, our, our relatives, uh, our grandparents, and so forth have experienced the persecution. But if you look at communism and how it was able to historically gain a, such a following in the entire world, I mean, you had the entire Russia and, and China and many other countries taken by communism in such a way that the world was almost literally split in half. Uh, this, was the, this was so true uh, about... Uh, the majority of the 20th century, you wonder how were they able to get that large of a following? Whatever movement you study, you're going to find out that a movement has a founder, a movement has a goal, it's got a means of its spreading, and it's got a method of its spreading as well. And when we study communism, we find out that there was a founder whose name was Karl Marx, uh, he was a German Jew who lived in the 18th century. Uh, we find out that communism has a goal, which is to change the world. We find out that the means of changing is through revolution, and the method is from, the method of communism that was used was to find those people who would be the disciples of Karl Marx, who will devote their lives completely and fully. And when you read the stories about the first communists, the ones who were in the initial stage of its development, you will be amazed at their commitment. Going back to Christianity, we're not to follow communism, and yet we've got a wonderful follow founder, Jesus Christ. He's not a man, he's a God-man. Our goal is to change the world, but it's really to change it one person at a time through regeneration and transformation. That's the goal that Jesus puts in front of his disciples. That's the goal of the church today. What is the means? The only means is through the blood of Christ. It's been provided for. We don't have to make a revolution. And what is the method? It's discipleship. It's really the same method, but what a blessed method. Disciples making disciples. A small crowd who has overturned the world, a small crowd of witnesses of just 11 who were the first disciples who knew that Jesus has rose again, were able to convince the world of their uh, time in that fact, and the world got changed. Communists were willing to pay that price, and they did change the world even for a while. Are we willing to pay that price? May God speak to our hearts today. Shall we pray?